I'm at one of the oldest natural areas in the city of Guelph, a place with trees that were here before John Galt arrived in this area. It's a place with a history that may surprise you. Uh, my name's Ken Irvin, and I'm the education coordinator at Guelph Museums, and I'm in the dairy bush. Now, this eight and a half hectare bush is located on the University of Guelph campus and is bordered by Edinburgh Road, College Avenue, and numerous student residences. Uh, Frederick Stone, who owned who Stone Road is named after, was the owner of much of the land that the university now resides on. He, like most landowners of the time, viewed land as a commodity uh, to be exploited either through farming, pasturing, or selling. He'd cleared most of his land, except for two small tracts of forest that he used to harvest firewood. The larger of the two uncleared areas of forest is now the Arboretum, and that borders Victoria Road, uh, and the smaller forest of 18 acres is the Dairy Bush, which is where we are now. Uh, it's known as the dairy bush, as Frederick Stone was said to pasture his dairy cows here in the shade of the forest during the warm summer months, and that was down in the, this end of the forest. In 1873, Frederick sold over 600 acres of his land for $40,000 to the Ontario government to establish the Ontario College of Agriculture here. Okay, we're just outside of the dairy bush, and close by to the dairy bush is a small forested area known as Brown's Wood. And it's just behind me, just past the line of evergreen trees you can see just behind me. Uh, this is a very historic and very important site in ecological restoration. Originally, this area was part of the larger deciduous forest that encompassed this area. Then in the year 1840, uh, the land was cleared and a gravel pit was operated here. And that went, ran from about 1874 to 1886. Uh, in the year 1874, uh, also, was the year the Ontario College of Agriculture opened. And it was also the year that William Brown was hired by the school to be the professor of agriculture and farm superintendent. Now, Brown's father, James, had written the very first comprehensive and scientific book on forestry in the year 1847. Well, luckily the nut didn't fall far from the tree as his son William was a very big proponent of forest re restoration and reforestation and recreating biodiversity. Uh, by the year 1887, Brown had planted 2,300 saplings in the former gravel pit. Uh, he planted 14 different species of n some native, some exotic hardwoods, and some evergreens. Um, and Brown's wood is now the earliest ecological restoration and experimental forest plantation in North America. By replanting the gravel pit, uh, Brown demonstrated that forests could return ecological value to the landscape. Uh, Brown was a big man with an equally big appetite for scotch and an equally big personality to match his size, um, which I guess made him not the easiest guy to get along with. Uh, he is known to have numerous fights with the university president, uh, James Mills, and uh, Mills Hall is named after James Mills. Uh, you can see a picture of that here. Brown was actually fired for insubordination uh, in 1890, and he died penniless in Australia in 1903. In the year 1995, not too long ago, uh, the area was officially named Brown's Wood, and a plaque was unveiled to him. Uh, and according to biology professor and professor emeritus at the university and tree expert, uh, Doug Larson, uh, having the plaque there uh, saved this bush from becoming another building site on the university campus. The dairy bush also became part of a reforestation project undertaken by Brown's replacement, uh, Edmund Zavitz. And then here's a picture of Edmund Zavitz. And it's the second oldest experimental plantation in North America. Uh, but not all of the dairy bush is old growth. The part of the woods furthest from Edinburgh Road, so this part right behind me, uh, was planted in 1906. You can see from the aerial picture that some of the trees uh, were planted in straight lines, and they don't naturally grow in straight lines, so these were, uh, were planted. Uh, an OAC report uh, around that time stated these plantations are of value from an experimental and educational standpoint. Well, that proved really correct because in, in 1975 the bush became a living laboratory and classroom as Doug Larson, uh, and you can see a picture of Doug here, he began taking his students into the bush and since Doug started this thousands of students have explored and learned from the forest. Doug's successors have also incorporated the study of the dairy bush into their courses and the new university's first year course Discovering Biodiversity has 1,700 students each year conducting field work in the bush. And the bush that for many is a classroom and an, sort of an urban oasis was for me 
kind of an extension of my front yard. I live just over the hill here. Um, and when I was a kid, my friends and I would cross College Avenue and make our way through the field. Uh, and and a, the field occasionally had cows pasturing in it that we had to try and traverse. Uh, most of the time it had crops planted here. Um, but I remember uh, one time there was even a rodeo uh, going on at the bottom of the hill with uh, cattle roping and, uh, and uh, bucking broncos. So it was a pretty active place. Uh, but after crossing the field and entering the woods, we felt like we were kind of explorers uh, with our own private forest. And we knew that we weren't the only ones uh, in the forest. We always saw people walking through the woods, and the occasional university student was here. Um, and we also discovered small hideouts that some university students had built using uh, some building material that they had pilfered from nearby construction sites. And upon occasion, we liberated some of this building material to make our own tree forts back at home. In researching the dairy bush, I discovered that students have been visiting the woods for decades. Uh, in the year 1931, uh, Gloria Fielhaller um, wrote that spring in the environs, environs of the OAC is a time to be enjoyed to the full, with an occasional game of tennis, a hike or two, picnics in the dairy bush, and of course long hours at McDonald campus with a chemistry or cookbook for company. Uh, there was also, I, I found a write-up uh, in the OAC review from 19, the same year, 1931, uh, on October 10th, the good old dairy bush was the scene of a very successful wiener roast staged by year 31. The night was mild and cloudy, and we were soon all settled comfortably around a big fire, and after absorbing many wieners and marshmallows and sundry bottles of pop, we listened to a fine musical program which Norm Lindsay had organized for us. Before leaving, we made the woods ring with some co college veils, and then the long procession marched as rapidly as possible to the lights of Mack Hall. And then another instance I found was um, an interview from a guy, uh, Johnny Moles, who was a graduate in 1936. Uh, he was interviewed about his experience at the, o at the OAC, and uh, I guess he was very active in um, livestock judging and sports and the College Royal, and he was asked if uh, there was ever any alcohol he consumed on campus. Well, and his response was, oh, oh, well, um, of course we weren't allowed any, but there were a few people that I know that used to bury a, a barrel of cider back in the dairy bush. And if we were lucky and it didn't turn into vinegar, we had some pretty good ciders and it was relatively hard. So that was from uh, Johnny Moles from 1936. In 1967, the University of Guelph ski team was looking for a place to train, uh, other than just using the running track around the football field, uh, which was all they had. Uh, the coach of the Alpine and Nordic ski teams was Alex Sass Pipri, uh, who had been a professor of human kinetics at the School of Physical Education at Guelph uh, since the late 1950s. Now, Sass has a really interesting story. Um, he was a youth sports leader uh, in Estonia, and he came to Canada with his family via Finland and Sweden. Uh, where, after the war, he learned about the sport of orienteering. And during his early days in Canada, he organized basic orienteering events at youth and scout camps uh, using topographic or simple uh, hand-drawn black and white maps. Then in 1966, Sass observed the first World Orienteering Championships in Finland. And he brought that experience uh, home and he organized the first Ontario Championships uh, in 1967. Uh, but during these early days, Sass also organized other clinics, from clinics uh, in the Ontario, the Maritimes, British Columbia, and even um, for the U.S. Marines at Quantico. Uh, he organized the first U.S. championships in 1970, uh, and he was also director of the popular annual Guelph Spring Festival orienteering meet. Uh, Sass was the president of the Orienteering Society uh, from 1974 to 76. And the university even has a scholarship and a plaque dedicated in his honor uh, here in the dairy bush. Uh, there's still an annual Sass Peepree National Junior Orienteering training camp and a Sass Peepree trail at Camp Towingo. And here's a picture of a t-shirt with uh, Sass Peepree's name on it uh, from just a couple years ago. In Sass's spare time, uh, he even gave ski lessons to beginners. Um, and in 1967, uh, he, along with Jack Barr, uh, pushed to get better training facilities for the downhill ski team. Now, Jack, he attended the University of Guelph after serving 10 years uh, in the Canadian Air Force. Uh, and during Jack's time at Guelph, he was captain of the university ski team. 
Uh, and while Sass and Jack were discussing how do they get the ski team off the running track and onto an actual ski hill, um, the idea of creating a ski hill on campus sort of formed. Uh, the closest skiing to Guelph at the time uh, during the 1960s and 70s was at Corwin, which was a small hill just outside of Guelph and Aberfoyle. In 1967, the construction of the McKinnon Building and the married student residences on Stowed Road were just starting. The university would have to uh, pay the construction company to haul away the excavated soil. So SAS, Jack and the Outdoors Club pushed the idea of building a ski hill on the top of the hill in the dairy bush using the excavated soil. Well, surprisingly, that idea was approved. The hill in the bush was the high point of land, uh, being part of the drumlin field that exists in Guelph. Uh, the university agreed to this as it would have cost them more money to truck the soil away and dispose of it. Several mature walnut trees uh, were cut down on the hill to expand the base of the growing dairy bush hill. Now, Jack did not want the wood to go to waste. He had the logs moved away from the ski hill and into the woods, and after a few years, he retrieved the logs. Uh, they were taken to a mill uh, and cut up and dried. And some of the lumber actually made its way to the walls of Jack's living room here in Guelph. Uh, now the hill did grow 60 feet higher with the trucked in soil and trails were then cut through the woods for downhill and cross-country skiing. Uh, lights were installed for night skiing and there were even plans for a campfire ring and uh, shelter, but these never materialized. Now the ski hill was mainly for the university community. Uh, the ski team would have a local place to practice and the staff, students and the university community had a recreation area that could be used in the winter months. Uh, in 1977, the last year that I can find of it was in operation, uh, the fees to use the lifts were really very reasonable. Uh, you could buy a season's pass, but a day pass for university students and staff only cost a dollar. Uh, downtown people, which the rest of Guelph were referred to by the university, um, could ski here as well, but it cost them $2.50 a person and a dollar for those under 13. Uh, there were full schedules of ski classes and the university ski club offered lessons uh, four days a week. Uh, There's even a credit course offered for skiing. Um, ski gear could be rented here um, and at the university center for a dollar for students. And there even was a limited supply of uh, equipment you could rent on the hill. Um, the hill was open to the public from 7 to 10 during the week and from noon to 4.30 on weekends. And with good snow conditions, they hope to stay open until mid-March or later. We're on top of the ski hill right now. Uh, and there really weren't very many bells and whistles on the ski hill. Um, right behind me is where the uh, ski tow rope came up the hill. And just on the other side of the camera is where the anchor for the ski tow was. Uh, but there really weren't a lot of bells and whistles uh, here. There wasn't any concession stand or corner store uh, or a place to warm up. Um, There's just a rope tow, three pretty decent runs. Um, and when work was being done on the rope tow, uh, SAS actually put an ad in the university newspaper asking for someone to help splice this big tow rope together. Now Jack, in his, uh, he being a skier, he wanted a bigger ski hill, uh, and he wanted an additional uh, 50 feet put on top of the hill to make a few more really challenging runs. Um, there was plenty of dirt and foundation soil to use, but it would have meant uh, taking out more of the forest uh, to expand the base of the hill. And the ski hill, it did run for 10 years, but without snowmaking equipment here, uh, the, the hill had to rely on Mother Nature for snow to cover the slopes. Uh, with several warm and less than snowy winters came the downfall of the ski hill. Um, and it, what was once the only active ski hill on a university campus in North America. Uh, now evidence of the ski hill has been found recently as Professor Alex Smith from Guelph uh, was in the woods with his kids and they found a basket of a ski pole from that era uh, just on the back side of the hill. Unfortunately, uh, Sass Peepery, uh, who was the driving force for the ski hill, passed away in 1976. Uh, and the last year I have found any record of the ski hill running was in 1977. Uh, in that same year, a plaque at the base of the ski hill was unveiled by Sass's wife, and it is dedicated to the amazing work and life of Alex Sass Peepery. One of the ski runs actually went right behind where I'm standing and down the hill. Now the ski, the dairy bush is now a lot quieter without the ski hill running, um, but that doesn't mean nothing is happening in the bush. There are still hundreds of students every year utilizing it as a natural laboratory. 
And with the increased residential development around the bush, there has been some degradation to the woodlot through increased trail use, soil compaction, and litter. Um, but there is a way to see the bush without impacting it. There are trail cameras set up to record the variety of wildlife that uh, make the bush their home. Uh, in this urban forest, trail cameras have recorded deer, fox, coyotes, skunks, and raccoons, and more. And there are some great videos on YouTube of the dairy bush fox kits at their den, too. Um, you can also see a year in the life of the dairy bush through some amazing gigapan videos done by Professor Alex Smith. If you do visit the dairy bush, you can still find some evidence of the ski hill. The forest is gracefully taken back, the ski runs, and every year it gets a little harder to see their paths. But if you look closely, you can still see the cuts through the forest for the downhill ski trails and the path where the tow rope ran up the hill. Uh, the rope tow is gone, but you can see the cement anchor uh, for it at the top of the hill's peak. Uh, and students may still make the occasional hideouts in the woods. And I think all the barrels of cider have been retrieved. Um, and, but when you drive past the dairy bush, don't look at it as a rundown forest. See it as an outdoor classroom, an urban oasis uh, that has been here long before the university the city, or European settlement. And if you do have any stories of the ski hill or any pictures uh, when it was of the ski hill when it was in operation, please share them or pass them on to the museum. And I want to thank uh, Doug Larson and Jack Barr for passing on their knowledge of the dairy bush. Thanks for joining me today at Guelph's first and only ski hill.